Taiwan's economic development over the last 100, maybe 150 years has been very successful. Not always smooth, but successful. 19th century Taiwan was not a place you would choose to live. It was poor. Most people barely got by. In fact, many didn't get by. In the late 19th century, life expectancy at birth in Taiwan was probably about 25 years. Now, in 2023, everything's changed. Taiwan's you know, one of the richest economies on the planet. How this happened? Why did it happen? This course is going to address these questions. In this overview, I want to first give you some basic information on Taiwan and its history, especially for those of you who know very little about Taiwan. And then I want to tell you more concretely what the different units in this course are going to cover. Before I do that, though, I want to first introduce myself. My name is Kelly Olds. I'm an American. I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio. But I've had the good fortune to spend most of my adult life right here in Taiwan. I remember back as a university student, I began my university career as an engineering major, but what I really liked was languages. My second year of college, I started studying Chinese. I was really interested in Chinese literature. And I found out about this um, opportunity in Taiwan, summer course, you could learn more about Chinese culture. So I, I came here after studying a year of Chinese and got to know a little bit about Taiwan. I remember when I first got here, one of the things that most impressed me was going to the, to the National Palace Museum, just full of all this wonderful Chinese art. I spent a lot of days there. I also liked hiking around the mountains. Okay, there's mountains surrounding Taipei. You get up there in the rugged mountains hiking around. I always had the feeling that if I just looked hard enough, sooner or later, I was going to find some Taoist immortals. But maybe what most impressed me about Taiwan, and Taipei in particular, is how busy it was. It was like a beehive. You know, everybody was running around, and basically it seemed like everyone was trying to make money. Now, I had already taken a year's course of economics, um, but I grew up in the United States in a suburb. It's very quiet. You, know, you wake up, you hear the birds, tweet, tweet, tweet. Um, and I felt like the economy was something I'd never seen. You know, in the United States, the economy happens in these, these office buildings, you know, behind closed doors or in factories, which I never got into. When I got here to Taiwan, you know, I walked down the street and, hey, over there, there's this, uh, you know, a mom and pa store, and over there's another mom and pa store, and all oh, in the corner here, this guy's opened up a little stand, and he's selling juice, and then you walk a little further, and you, you look in the, the front door of this house, and, you know, it should be a living room, but that's not a living room, it's, it's full of sewing machines, and you know, there's a dozen women in there sewing clothing, you know, to export to the United States and make money, I started feeling like, wow, I'm actually looking at Adam Smith's economy. Okay, it really impressed me. So after half a year here, I decided, well, I, I need to get my degree. So I went back to the United States, and I went back to the university, and I told them, I'm not really that interested in engineering anymore. And I ended up with a double major in economics and Chinese. Now, once I graduated, 1981, my Chinese was still kind of well, pretty poor, really. I decided I had to get back to Taiwan. So I applied different places. Finally, ended up going to Donghai University in, in Taichung. And I went there and I studied the modern language. And I also studied literary Chinese so that I could read the, the old writing. And I started learning more about Taiwan. For one thing, I learned that no matter how much time I spent up there in the mountains hiking around, I was never going to find Taoist immortals, that, you know, most likely I was going to find Aborigines. And I also learned that, you know, Taiwan was not just a busy place, you know, full of people doing business. It had always been this way. You know, Calvin Coolidge once said, the business of America is business. You could really say the same thing about Taiwan. You know, the business of Taiwan has always been business. You know, from the very beginning, um, the Dutch came here. To trade, okay, and uh, you know, even before the Dutch were trading, the Aborigines were they were harvesting um, deer pelts and, and, and you know deer products to, to export to other places. 
Um, when the Chinese came here, this was not a place people came to just settle down. It wasn't a traditional place where people did what their fathers did and they, the fathers did what their grandfathers had done and, and so forth. It was a place people came to make money. Okay? So this was just the nature of the island and I began understanding that. Now, after spending a couple of years here, I, I got so that I could speak Chinese fairly well. Okay? I decided to go back to the United States I spent several years working at different jobs, and um, then I decided I was going to go back and get my PhD. And I got a PhD from the University of Rochester in economics, specializing in economic history. Um, you know, when I graduated, I spent one year teaching at an American college, and then in 1994, I got a job offering from National Taiwan University. You know, it was when I, I took it right away. Okay, now, you know, this was a great time to be an economic historian in Taiwan, because just a few years back, it's Taiwan started opening up. You started having freedom of speech. Um, researchers could now go into the archives and you know look at what they wanted and you know, pretty much write about what they wanted and you know not have to worry about being arrested. So there's a lot of great new work going on at this time. Okay. I got really caught up in this work and trying to understand Taiwan's economic development. Um, I've, I've loved it. I've loved every minute here. You know, I've never looked back. Okay, that's something about me. I don't know who you are. Maybe you were born and raised in Taiwan, but maybe you don't know much about Taiwan. Maybe you still get Taiwan and Thailand confused sometimes. Well, Taiwan is an island. It's an island off the shore of Fujian Province, China. In fact, the ancestors of most of the Taiwan population today originally came from South Fujian. Taiwan lies south of Japan and north of the Philippines. It's a you know, semi-tropical sort of island, uh, high, steep mountains, lots of vegetation. Taiwan is also a very populated island. Today it has about 23 million people. In size, it's only about as large as Switzerland. If you're thinking in terms of US states, it's about the size of Maryland. These are places with populations much less than 23 million. If you think of, trying to think of countries that are as large as Taiwan and you know, have a denser population, there's only one country out there like that. That's Bangladesh. So, you know, Taiwan, it's a small place. If you spin the globe, you might miss it. But it is one of the top 20 economies in size in the world. So it's important to the world economy. Taiwan is known for its semiconductors and its electronics. If you're using a computer, there's a good chance your computer was made by a Taiwanese company. If you're using anything with chips, there's a pretty good chance that your chips were made in Taiwan. Now, I want to say a little bit about the political history of Taiwan. That's not what we want to concentrate on, but just to kind of show you how Taiwan has developed, where it's come from. Back in the 1600, Taiwan was an island populated by Aborigines. It's probably 100,000 people on the island, maybe a little more. Okay, but this Aboriginal population was divided up into over a dozen different language groups. So it's a very small population and a very fragmented population. The first people to set up, you know, kind of a, a good sized town on the island were the Dutch. Okay, the Dutch come up here, you know, they came around Africa into the Indian Ocean in about 1600. They began their fight with the Portuguese to try to get Indian Ocean trade. They end up setting, their, setting up their Dutch East India Corporation or company's headquarters in Batavia, which is now Jakarta, Indonesia. and then. They decide they also want to, you know, kind of move in on the Chinese-Japanese trade. To do this, they decide to go up and they, they set up, you know, their base in Taiwan. And, you know, they decide that, you know, Taiwan has to make some money too. And so they also start encouraging some Chinese immigration. The Spanish also move up and try to set up a base in Taiwan. Um, the Dutch, though, are victorious and, and chase them off the island. And by the 1640s, the Dutch control most of Taiwan, except for maybe the high mountains. Now there's another force in the area, um, there's pirates in the area, and these pirates kind of coalesce under the Jung family. Okay. The Jungs have kind of a pirate kingdom. 
they're trying to do about the same thing the Dutch are doing. They want to monopolize trade. You know, they want to you know, do the trade themselves or at least, you know, make people doing trade all pay them protection money. They sometimes cooperate with the Dutch. Sometimes they fight with the Dutch. Now, in Chinese history during this period, this is known as the Ming Qing transition in the mid 1600s. The Manchus are coming down from northeast of China and they're fighting and they're defeating the old Ming dynasty in China. They're also taking over Mongolia and Xinjiang and Tibet. Okay. Well, the Zheng family, in particular Zheng Chenggong, he's, he decides that he's going to support what's left of the Ming and fight against these invaders, okay, the Manchus. They're trying to set up this conquest dynasty, the Qing dynasty. Well, it doesn't go that well for Zheng Chenggong at the beginning. He ends up having to retreat to Taiwan. And so you know, he, he does come to Taiwan and he kicks the Dutch out of Taiwan. It takes him about a year, but he forces the, the Dutch to leave Taiwan. He sets up Taiwan as his base of operations. He's only here for a year or two when he dies, but his, his son takes over and eventually they do manage to go back and take over parts of the mainland. Uh, but in the end, the Manchus, you know, they win and Taiwan becomes part of the Qing Empire, okay, the Qing Dynasty. So the Dutch, that's 1624 to 1662, then the Dutch are kicked off by the Zheng family. The Zheng are here from 20 years, about 20 years, 1662 to 1683. That's the romantic period of Taiwan's early history. You can read a number of books about that. The Qing period, there's not a lot written in English about the Qing dynasty period in Taiwan, but it lasts for 200 years. The Qing, they're not really sure right away what they want to do with the island. One of the first things they do is they try to get most of the Chinese population that were brought over by the Dutch and by the Zhengs, and they try to send them back across the strait. But eventually, they decide that, you know, Taiwan is going to be trouble if it's unpopulated. It might just turn out to become a pirate lair again. They decide they're going to have to take over the place and populate it. So eventually they do start allowing some migration to the island. During this period, Taiwan is a frontier area. It's gradually being settled by migrants who are coming in to try to make money off of the land and the water, okay, in Taiwan, okay. They're, they're mainly opening up farmland and opening up irrigation projects. And they, they gradually do open up almost all of Taiwan. Um, by the late 19th century, Taiwan is looking more and more just like a normal Chinese province. Now in 1895, we have the Sino-Japanese War. It's the first Sino-Japanese War, Sino-Japanese War, and the Chinese lose it, and as part of the treaty, they have to give up Taiwan to the Japanese. So now we get a period of 50 years where Taiwan is a Japanese colony. You know, this is a period of gradual modernization, okay, and um, you know, gradual economic growth, economic development. This lasts to 1945. You know, what happens is that there's a second Sino-Japanese War, beginning in 1937, which merges into what most people would call World War II, the Japanese lose that, of course. When they lose that, they have to give up Taiwan. They give it to the Republic of China. Now, the Qing Dynasty has already fallen. It fell back in 1911. It was overthrown by the KMT, who sets up the Republic of China. By this period, you know, the, the KMT has united China, but they're really weakened after World War II. And after World War II, they get in a civil war with the Chinese Communists, and in 1949, they lose the civil war. So what happens is the KMT, led by Chiang Kai-shek, retreats to Taiwan. So Taiwan had been unified with, with, Republic, with China for about four years. Now Taiwan is all that's left of the Republic of China. Okay, and even today, um, Taiwan's official name is the Republic of China. And the flag is the flag of the Republic of China. Though most people would just refer to Taiwan as Taiwan. Okay. Now, next unit, I'm going to tell you a little bit about early history, just to let you know, you know, Taiwan has always been a place of business and trade. Then, in the unit after that, 
I'm going to say something about the early tea industry, which begins under the, the Qing Dynasty, in the late Qing Dynasty. I think this is kind of a foundational period for the Taiwan economy. But beyond that, we'll be talking about the Japanese era and the ROC era. Okay, that's, the, that's where we concentrate on. That's the period of modern economic development. We want to understand, you know, not really the political history of Taiwan, but how Taiwan went from, you know, an agricultural economy, you know, a simple agricultural economy, I guess, to a very complex, modern, urban, high-tech economy. Okay, that's the story, you know, we want, to, we want to understand. And I'll tell you my main point right off the, right off the top. Okay, when I, when I look back over over 25 years, of trying to understand Taiwan's economic development. The main point that, you know, that, that I kind of keep coming back to is that at least in Taiwan, economic development has been a lot like surfing. I think actually a lot of business is like surfing and maybe life is like surfing. But when I say it's like surfing, I say mean that Taiwan didn't get to where it got to today because it was good at making plans. I mean, Taiwan's governments have been, you know, rather competent, but they haven't been very good at foreseeing the future. Okay. If you're a surfer and you know you sit there on the beach and you're always planning, you know, what am I going to do when the next wave arrives? Okay, what do I think the wave after that's going to look like? Okay, um, you know, and then that third wave, you know, what do I think about that? Okay. You know, you're just a theorist. You're going to sit there all day. You're never really going to be much of a surfer. Okay. Surfers, they get out there and they know they can never predict what's going to come. They just take whatever comes. And if they're a good surfer, they're very good at taking whatever comes. Okay, they're very successful at it. Okay, they're good not because they're good planners and they know in advance what they're going to do. They're just very good at reacting. Okay? Well, that's what the Taiwan story of economic development is mainly about. Taiwan is a small open economy. Things around it are constantly changing. International demand is constantly changing. And Taiwan has done well because it's good at reacting. It reacts very quickly. Okay, I want to go through now and just quickly you know, give you the course outline, what exactly we'll be doing here. Um, I've broken the course into units, and each unit is divided up into sections, often three sections, but maybe sometimes two, sometimes maybe four. The first unit, or well, it's the second unit, this is the first unit, is on the early history of Taiwan. I'm not going to really give you an overview of this. I'm just going to pick out a few stories to, to let you know and all to what extent Taiwan was very much a place of business. One mistake people sometimes make about Taiwan is they imagine Taiwan used to be a very traditional economy. Well, I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by traditional. Taiwan has never been the sort of place where you know a person would say, I farm this land because my father farmed this land, and my grandfather farmed this land, and my great-grandfather farmed this land, and I do things their way. Okay. Taiwan was a place that was often filled with migrants and children of migrants who came here to a very dangerous environment because they wanted to make money. Okay. So that's the way it was from the beginning. And Taiwanese have always been open to change. And because they've always been here because they're trying to find new ways of making money. Okay? This way, they're very similar to, to maybe the overseas Chinese in, um, in Southeast Asia. After we tell you some stories about the, the early history, I'll go on and talk about tea. I think that the tea industry, this is in the, the late Qing period, the late 19th century. This is when you first start getting a large amount of Western capital entering Taiwan and falling into Taiwanese hands. It's giving Taiwan something to play with, and it's linking Taiwan to the international economy. Okay? So I think this is very important in kind of creating a foundation for Taiwan's future economic growth. And then later on, as the tea industry develops, it becomes a very good example of surfing. Because we will see that the, the, the tea industry, you know, demand for tea throughout the world is always changing. Taiwan, every 10, 15 years, has to find some new type of tea product that they can make money with. Okay, so they're constantly on the outlook for new, you know, new markets they can develop. Okay? And this is kind of, a, so this will give you a start in understanding what I mean by saying economic development is like surfing. Then we'll go on and talk about the sugar industry. Sugar 
you know, is, is a, 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 a crop that Taiwan has been producing for hundreds of years. But it was the Japanese that really create the modern sugar industry, and it's become kind of the symbol of Japanese imperialism. And I want to use this unit to talk a little bit about Japanese imperialism, you know, how it, it helped the island, how it didn't help the island. You know, it, 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 Taiwan did get a lot of good infrastructure from the Japanese, okay? um, but I think the sugar mills in the long run weren't much help to the Taiwanese. They were kind of an enclave economy, which was owned by the, the, the Japanese, it didn't have very great effects on the rest of the, the Taiwanese economy. And in the end, I don't think sugar was very useful to Taiwan. Okay, but um, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about rice. Okay. And rice, you know, this again is a crop that Taiwan has produced for centuries. But during the Japanese period, Taiwan did start creating a new type of rice. They started producing pond lye rice. And Taiwan rice exports became very big. And I think this, this rice crop gives us a good illustration of how the Taiwanese did manage um, to gain under Japanese rule. It was kind of with this rice crop. I mean, the, the reason this rice crop succeeds is because Taiwanese began to find ways to get capital from the Japanese, okay? getting Japanese finance. With the sugar industry, the finance was always controlled by the Japanese. Now, finance are trickling into the hands of the Taiwanese they can use this to start developing their own economy. Okay, so I, I think rice kind of shows you, that's kind of when the breakthrough comes. Okay? And it's the, the finance that is kind of involved with this new rice crop okay, that, that leads Taiwan to, to become an ever wealthier colony. Then I'm going to talk about mining. Mining is really a small industry compared to the, the agriculture. In particular, we're going to talk about gold mining. And the reason I'm going to talk about this here is there were two big gold mines in Taiwan. In fact, Taiwan had the biggest gold mine in Asia at the time. But one gold mine was run by the Japanese. Another was run by the Taiwanese. So this is a good industry to kind of understand how the Taiwanese way of doing business differed from the Japanese way of doing business. And, you know, how the Taiwanese way of doing business was special. And then I'm going to look at hat exports. Most courses on Taiwan economic development, I think, would skip over hats. At most, they were about 2 or 3 percent of Taiwan's exports during the Japanese period. But the hats are really important because they foreshadow the consumer export goods boom that we're going to see in the 1960s after World War II. Okay? That this is the first time the Taiwanese figure out how to do a, a labor-intensive consumer goods export that's going to be very successful for them. Though, of course, we're only talking about 2 or 3% of, of the exports. Okay. This is still a, a you know, pretty impressive bit of business. What's impressive about it is that I'm going to argue that Taiwan's comparative advantage throughout the 20th century was speed-intensive production. You know, very good at quickly reacting and changing markets. Before World War II, foreign trade was almost impossible as far as these sort of quickly changing markets are concerned. Because, you know, transportation was done by ships. There wasn't any telephones, you know. Communication was done by letters. Internationally, things were just too slow for any sort of fast production. But hats were something of an exception. Okay? The, the, hat, um, the, the United States had importers. They were kind of piggybacking on the, the people, the silk buyers that the Americans had in Japan. And this left kind of a crack in the door for Taiwanese producers to start producing these fashion-intensive consumer exports and sending them to Western markets. Okay. I think, in some ways, this kind of lays the, the foundation for Taiwan's future growth. But things don't you know, develop easily. We get into the 1930s. This is a period of rising fascism. And here we're going to look at kind of the nationalistic controlled economy that's set up in Taiwan by the Japanese. I see this as it's kind of an unfortunate detour where a lot of markets are shut down. Uh, you know, Taiwan, Taiwan um, probably, is product, probably its development is delayed by this. When we talk about political history, I've already made clear that, you know, 20th century is divided in half. The first half, that's the period of Japanese rule. The second half, that's the Republic of China period. Well, in economic history, I would divide the 20th century into three parts. 
The first part is the early market economy up until maybe the mid-1930s. Okay. The second part is the period of this nationalistic controlled economy. It begins maybe in the mid to late 1930s and it lasts through World War II and then really it continues all the way into the 1950s. So although the government changes, uh, the, you know, the manner of nationalistic control doesn't change that much. Okay. Then in the 1960s we get the return to the market economy and that's when Taiwan really takes off. So we'll talk about this kind of this fall into kind of a controlled nationalistic economy. And then after 1949, okay, 1950s, that's when we start seeing a gradual return maybe to a, to a market economy. This is a period of recovery. Some people look at the 1950s as a period where the foundation of Taiwan's future export success was laid. And I disagree with that view. But the 1950s was an important time when the controlled economy was gradually you know, kind of weakened and the market was gradually allowed to develop. And this was done with a lot of American help and American aid. Okay, so we'll talk about these, this period. Then Taiwan really takes off with the consumer exports. Okay? Things like clothes, shoes, toys. Okay? This is the mid-1960s. There's this boom in exports. This is what people mean when they talk about the Taiwan miracle. I don't like to talk about the Taiwan miracle because miracles don't have natural causes. This had a natural cause. But it seemed like a miracle at that time. I mean, not just for outsiders who suddenly saw, you know, this, this island, I've never heard of it. How's it growing 10 or 12 percent a year? Okay, and what's happened there? But people in Taiwan as well, they could hardly believe their good fortune. I mean, it, it seemed to them maybe almost magical. Okay, how is it that we can actually grow this fast? They didn't themselves really understand what they were doing right. Now, by the 1970s, I mean, this consumer export are still going on, they're still growing, but the government decides that the Taiwan's economy needs to grow more in sophistication. It has to grow beyond these light consumer goods. This is something that's being done by many countries in the world in the 1970s. They start trying to push heavy industry. You know, this is what real modernization is all about. Some countries were more successful at this. South Korea is an example. Okay, they, were, they, they were more successful with heavy industry. I, I judge Taiwan did not be very successful, though there were a few successes. Um, but um, this was, you know, a, a big investment made by um, made by the Taiwan government, and um, I think it shows, you know, the the difficulty in trying to predict the future. And I think kind of this consumer export boom was something that came out of nowhere; it was not predicted. But Taiwanese did very well with it because they were good surfers. Okay. Consumer goods are always changing in fashion, and the Taiwanese could produce fast enough they could keep up with those fashions. Okay. The government then tried to predict that there would be a, you know, that Taiwan would soon accumulate enough capital that they could make more money in heavy industry. The government's prediction largely turned out to be false. But Taiwan was still successful, and that's because of the electronics industry. And I want to show that the electronics industry was basically an outgrowth of the consumer goods export industry. You know, you, you start out sending out all these plastic toys, this sort of thing. It's not a very big step from that to start, you know, putting chips into these plastic plastic containers and turning out things like calculators, maybe digital watches, and then gradually you move on to things like computers and cell phones. Okay. But Taiwan was successful in consumer goods because they could keep up with the changes and the, the fast-moving, you know, fast-moving changes in fashion. In electronics, speed is equally important because of the fast change in technology. Once a new technology comes out, you have to very quickly get that technology into a product and to market and before a new technology comes out, which is going to displace this old new technology. Taiwan, again, was very good at that. They were very fast moving, very good at reacting. They managed to catch almost every wave that comes by. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about Taiwan's outward FDI, which has become very important now. Um, in the late 1980s, Taiwan had a big financial boom. Stock market you know, grew by you know, over 12 times, okay, a huge bubble. But during this period, Taiwan became a much more expensive producer. Land prices, labor starts becoming too expensive. So Taiwanese you know, production lines start moving abroad. 
places like Southeast Asia and, and even China, China much more so. Okay, many of, many of the production lines moved across to straight to China, and nowadays they're moving even further. Okay, so I want to talk about how Taiwan is now. Their companies are gradually spreading their production throughout the world. And then one little last short unit. I want to say something about Taiwan's present and Taiwan's future. Okay. I can't predict the future because the waves that you know that, that roll through the world economy are never really predictable. Okay, but I want to give you some ideas about you know what sort of things you're going to have to think about when you're trying to think of where Taiwan might be going in the future. Okay, that's about it for the introduction. Over here, this is the course outline. You know, it's 13 units, each unit approximately three sections. Each section, you know, 30 minutes, sometimes more, occasionally maybe less. I, you know, I don't know what you're looking for, but if you want to understand Taiwan's economic development, I really hope you stick around.